Well, can you hear me? Buongiorno. Buongiorno, amigos. So, each year we go to the Houston Natural Science Museum because they have this beautiful exhibit, um, the National Geographic's Photographs of the Year. And if I hadn't been to the ICTP, I would never know immediately what this was. But I saw this, I couldn't believe it. I think I emailed it to you, Christian, because it's so beautiful. The Miramari Castle. Um, so this is one of the best photographs of the year. So if anyone wants to go scuba diving in front of Miramari Castle, I, I brought my gear. I would love to try to shoot a picture like this. So as Marielle said, I'm going to give a talk today about how we need to move beyond the static structures of Watson and Crick and think about dynamic supercoiling. And I've shown this slide before, but it always serves as a really nice introduction. So this is linear DNA. This is what we know a whole lot about. This is that elastic rod, worm-like chain, persistence length DNA that people talk about. Here it is. And if you circularize it, it's a relaxed DNA. Here you go. This is where most of our experiments are done. But if you look at, consider what DNA activities are going to go on, not much is going on at that level of supercoiling. Across the bottom of this axis here, I have increasing supercoiling. So here is the relaxed DNA that we know a lot about. This is the Watson Crick helix. And if you just underwind this thing relative to itself and allow it to rise up, that's what's shown increasingly across that bottom axis, okay? Till this point of highly writhed DNA right here, okay? Very good model right here. So what you see, and I think it's amazing, I still find it amazing, it's what I've been working on for years, is this amazing phase transition where there's no activity at all until a critical level of supercoiling is reached, at which point it turns on. And this was first measured for um, site-specific recombination. Then it was second measured for transcription initiation. Then it was measured for initiation of replication. These are all in E. coli, the bacterium. They were then later measured. This exact curve was seen in yeast. And even recently, this kind of activity curve has been seen in human cells. So across all the kingdoms of life, it seems that DNA holds the key, something about the structure that we know a lot about transitions to a structure we know almost nothing about, and it's almost magical, and it's a turn, a switch on. As you might imagine, I, when I'm lecturing in undergrads, I ask, I ask for people to volunteer, where do you think cancer cells have their DNA? Way up here. So in a cancerous cell, it can't turn the switch back off. And cancer is, in fact, uncontrolled growth. So I started working on this problem years ago because I was thinking if we could only understand what transition point happens, then maybe we can be able to turn it back down in cancer or in infectious diseases because in infection, those DNAs are also very, very active, more active than the normal. So, as I mentioned, most of our experiments are done here, and what we know a lot about DNA, this lovely DNA that's linear and dead, is here. But what I want to know is what is this phase transition? What happens here? So what happens to activate DNA? We've proposed it could be kinking, base flipping, and I'll show you pictures of these things. Um, denaturation, this one's sort of what everybody thought, but if it were gen denaturation in general, what we all thought, would you would get this nice kind of monotonic increase with increasing supercoiling, because that's what we thought denaturation should look like if it were acting like an elastic medium, such as this phone cord. So not only is DNA kept in all cells at this critical transition point, where it can be turned on or turned off very rapidly and thus controlled, transiently through the cells, through all cells, there are, there are waves of positive supercoiling and waves of extreme negative supercoiling. So homeostatically, it's kept at one state, but constantly, as the polymerases go zipping through, 
you get extreme overwinding in front of, this is RNA polymerase, and this is DNA polymerase. When you're making duplicates, this is replication, making copies, you're not necessarily getting increased negative supercoiling behind the fork. There are nicks back there. But here, as this thing zips through the double strands, you have transiently very negative supercoiled here, very positive supercoiled here. And again, back to this cancer angle, the most important antibiotic drug target, so also for antibiotic resistance, which we heard a little bit from the TWAS man yesterday, the most important antibiotic drug targets in the world are the DNA gyrase and top isomerase 4. They prefer to act at the positive supercoiled level. And we know nothing about positive supercoiled DNA. We don't have a crystal structure. We don't know anything. People don't study that, of course. And also the anti-cancer drug target, the human topo isomerase 2 alpha, it also preferentially acts here. So it's thought that somehow the topo isomerase drug DNA ternary complex is in the positive supercoil state. So I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to uh, nomenclature that I hope is routine for most of you. Um, but if we consider the basic state of, of linking, so that would be this most relaxed state, or the one we know a lot about, right, the LK naught. This equals N, the number of base pairs, divided by H, the helical repeat. And sometimes people get confused about helical repeat. So let's just count these. So one, two, you see how I'm counting this? One complete turn to another, all right? How many of them are there in this particular circle? Well, there are 30 here. And we, we relate this to length by sigma, which is basically just a normalization of, all right, if this is completely relaxed, this should have a, 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 a linking number, a sigma of zero, okay, it's not really fair, but zero. Um, but in fact, this particular example should be 32, but it's 30 because we counted them. And so therefore, the delta LK is minus 2. The sigma in this case would be about 6.5% underwound. So think of sigma as just percent underwound, all right, or overwound. And that's important because sigma normalizes for size. So we can compare something in a chromosome that's very long or a plasmid that's very long to a tiny, tiny bit of DNA, such as our crystal structures that we have of the linear DNA. So a while ago, and this is when physicists started talking to me, um, we did some molecular dynamics simulations of just twist, trying to get at that question of what is that transition that happens when you go from inactive DNA with the persistence length of 150 base pairs to active DNA. What is that transition? So to try to get at that, we simulated um, multiple different states of supercoiling. And I'm not going to talk about this. This is published work now. But I just want to point out that the elastic rod holds true for relaxed DNA and for a little bit of overwound DNA. It does not at all hold true for underwound, negatively supercoiled DNA. So biology is kept, as I've already pointed out. All life seems to keep our DNA at this level, around 9%, 8%. 8% underwound, but transiently we can get to even these extreme levels. So what did we see? We saw base flipping. So what is base flipping? I'll show a picture of it in a second. But the base just flips out spontaneously. Boom. No proteins are doing this. No ATP is binding. Nothing. It's just spontaneously flipping out. We also saw denaturation, but not in this monotonic denaturation that we kind of thought with the elastic rod model, but with this very sudden burst of, um, of activity. So there'd be a base flip and a denaturation. We never saw those things in the positive supercoiling. And then in the most positive supercoiled DNA, the entire thing flipped inside out so that the phosphates were on the inside and the bases were splayed outside. Now, we, th we thought that the, that the thing must have blown up, but we got it repeatedly and for every bit of supercoiling over a critical th threshold level. 
Well, that was pretty cool, but it's just simulation, and you know how, I think some of you know how people are about just simulations. You must prove it, right? Um, but I just want to point out again that persistence length that we know happens in a regime that's not necessarily active, and the persistence length is not defined here, and in fact may be infinitely flexible. All right, our data perfectly aligned with these beautiful force extension measurements done by the Bin Simon and Croquet groups, where they overwound or underwound DNA and stretched it and let it come back. The elastic test, right? How elastic is this medium? And what I want to point out is that it's only elastic. You can stretch it and it'll come back. Stretch it, it comes back. But it's only elastic and only comes back to a very little bit of underwinding, and then you stretch it and it stays. It does not bounce back. And then you need a little more torque before you can stretch and it doesn't bounce back in the positive direction. So this is something pretty dramatic. You don't recover the elastic properties at a certain level of supercoiling, just like you don't here. I want to point out also that one polymerase can put 15 piconewtons of force, just one. And in bacteria, you can have a whole slew of polymerases lined up and acting together. We don't know that they're necessarily additive, but there's at least 15 piconewtons put on DNA constantly. And 15 piconewtons means DNA doesn't ever see this elastic regime. And this is put nicely into a diagram of phase, because not actually a phase transition, but it acts a lot like one. Here we're looking at negative supercoiling here, positive supercoiling. Here is beloved BDNA, B-form DNA. And you see just a little bit left of negative supercoiled. You're in something pretty much undefined. So physicists called it linear, because what they envisioned was that the DNA became train tracks. So it became so unwound that it just, the two things laid out, I think. But that doesn't ever happen. Um, but they were just trying to explain this very sharp transition. It's reminiscent of the first slide I showed you. DNA activity is dead, dead, dead active, right? So the two things to me coming together said there was something really interesting about the transition point from BDNA to something else more active, and in the positive supercoil direction to something, and they called it polling like because there was such a sharp phase transition. And then this one is supercoil because you get it. Now, I just want to point out that, um, oh, so B is rare to non existent, and the phase diagram is distinctly asymmetric. So it's not the perfect elastic medium, all right? And this, oh, here's some pictures. This is what polling like DNA would look like. And this is what B form, of course, looks like. But this has been updated. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but they've gotten more and more sensitive with their measurements. And so now they can break down these, these, these phase transitions into subdomains. But basically, the truth that I just showed you remains. So the summary of our molecular dynamic simulations was that the localized structural failure, so the failure could be a base flipping or a denaturation, allowed the rest of the molecule to adapt B form, the form we know and love. So there was a complete mess and then B form. The denaturation always started with a base flip. So it went base flip, base flip, and then denaturation. So the denaturation didn't just pull apart like we envision with our, with our heating measurements. So here's a picture of a flipped out base, crystal structure of it. This is one of the first ones ever seen. And I think these are enzymes that are knotted, Sophie. I think this is one of your knotted enzymes. So these really cool, important enzymes that have knots in them themselves somehow stabilize this base flip transition. And it was a big mystery for everyone where does the energy come from? Because thermodynamically, you're not going to pull a base pair in its lovely environment out into a solvent. It's just not going to happen. But yet it does. It's been captured now 300 times with crystallography. But we find 
that torsional stress, the underwinding of the DNA, can pop that DNA base out and that the protein then can bind to it. So we also found that the, the, D, the overwound and underwound DNA profoundly differ and the torsional stress is not uniformly distributed over the length of the helix. And that means that it's not an elastic medium. Here, a perfect elastic medium, if I unwind here, I feel it over here, right? But no, you have to picture what's happening in the real underwound DNA. As you underwind, you base flip here, you base flip there, you denature there. From here on, you're just going to stay BDNA. This end doesn't feel it once that has flipped out. So that's actually pretty interesting, and it's a kind of a patchy idea instead of this elastic medium idea. And I, I didn't show this at all, but that we looked, we actually had the counter ions in these simulations, and we watched where the sodium was. So Manning's theory said that it would be this nice gradient coming in, this nice kind of um, normal looking gradient. But what we found is if you unwound and wound the DNA, you wrung out those sodium ions almost like a sponge. So it was very sharply dependent on the degree of underwinding. So even the counter ion field changes with supercoiling. And what I found kind of interesting is that these counter ions were never found around the polling like DNA. And here's actually from our simulations, this inside out structure with the bases splayed for whatever reason, and maybe it's because these are very hydrophobic, the counter ion field was not present here. And now it was kind of bumpy here. So this landscape that we envision of this perfect, you know, nice landscape, in fact, is sort of bumpy and thumpy and has a lot of interesting features to it. And we postulated that that could be one of the things that proteins or other nucleic acids or even drugs could interact with DNA. So these simulations, they provided atomistic explanations for the very sharp transitions in force extension experiments measured by others. And they reveal the myriad of potential features that other nucleic acids, proteins, or drugs might recognize. But as the reviewers of our paper said, so this paper that was published in NIR, which is a journal I love, sat at science for a year. And the reviewers said, you must prove it. You must test it with real DNA, as if that's easy, right? So we didn't do that. We published it in NAR. And it took me now seven more years to do the proof. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So how do we do the proof? So in our simulations, we had only simulated twist. We didn't allow the DNA to rise. We were only unwinding it and winding it as it was held, OK? So we need to get writhe in there, because that's real DNA, right? So the way we did it is we needed to make a whole lot of tiny circles. Big plasmids are just very difficult for many, many reasons. I could give you an hour lecture on that, but I'm not going to. Remember that in these diagrams of plasmids, underneath it is double-stranded DNA, OK? So we used just took advantage of all the knowledge that people had generated over the years for recombination. And we put these two site-specific recombination sites here, at P and at B. And we just moved these arrows closer and closer and closer together. And we said, how small can we go? And there was a different question. And we published that, of course. But what we were really trying to do was make tiny, tiny circles of DNA so we could do these real experiments to test the, the hypotheses put forth from our molecular dynamics simulations. So lambda integrase will take these sites and recombine and make a catenated intermediate. So here's the, the rest of the plasmid, and here's this little catenate. And TOPA4 normally decatenates that, and so you have a little circle and this big thing. Well, the trick was, how in the world do we separate this little from all the rest of this mess? And that took us several years to figure out, but we now have done it. And what's really fun is when people try to do, for example, these J factor measurements, you can put certain sequences into linear DNA and have it ligate, right, on a pretty short length scale. 
But we didn't want to be caught by certain sequences. We wanted to be able to put any sequence in there because we wanted to study different biological processes, maybe initiation of replication or initiation of transcription or site-specific, anything that we wanted to do. So it was really gratifying to us that we can put any sequence in red, we can clone it in in this parent plasmid, which is very easily to manipulated since the 80s. So we did not invent this. This is easy to do. What's hard is this part for us. Um, we can put any sequence in the world here, and that's right here if you get rid of all the supercoiling and just lay this thing out as a circle. Here's this sequence. And so you can put any DNA sequence. So unlike when you're going to ligate linear DNA and try to see, oh, you know, will it, what's the persistence length? In fact, that's where it comes from, is how, much, how long can it be before the two ends will come together? Unlike that method, this method tells you, well, this is what DNA persistence length really is in real biology, because this is done in a live bacterium. We let the bacterium do the work, and then we pull the DNA out and say, wow, it's pretty tiny, and it's pretty supercoiled. And what's really been very, very exciting is that because we can put any DNA sequence in this, and it doesn't have all the negative things that come with a plasmid, such as antibiotic resistance genes, such as bacterial sequences, this, in fact, has turned into a very important gene therapy vector. So this is being used for important gene therapy. I'm not going to talk about that today, but if you want to talk to me about that, I'm happy to, to talk about it. If I have any voice left, I hope you can hear me. Um, I usually can talk, and I don't know what happened to my health these last few days. OK, we've already done a little introduction of this, but I'm going to add this component. Remember that linking number is twist plus writhe. And in the previous time I told you this, the twist was the only thing we had changed. I didn't allow any writhe. And this, in fact, was truly planar. If you looked at it, there was no writhe at all from the side. And we're going to let writhe happen now. So now we have to consider the writhe component. So delta LK is the change in writhe plus the change in twist. So if you're going to change twist, you have to overcome the torsional rigidity of DNA. If you're going to change writhe, you have to overcome bending rigidity of DNA. These are two very different forces. And so this twist and writhe question is, is pretty fundamental and pretty cool and goes back to the, my first love, which is math. Um, but we're going to get there. So what is, it, what is it about making these tiny circles that's advantageous? Well, here is an atomic force micrograph of a typical size plasmid. And you can see that, well, there they are. And they're supercoiled. And they're kind of big. And there's a lot of different conformations, even in a pretty you know, tight distribution on a gel. Here is our new little mini circle. So they're very tiny. They're in the nanometer range. And if you're going to ask, for example, about enzymes binding, let's say my favorite enzyme, topoisomerase 2. Well, here the topo 2 has been drawn to scale. If you were going to do an experiment, how many topo 2 would you add per one of these molecules? Well, you might say 1, 2, 3, 4, maybe 10, right? Maybe 10 could bind. You want to do one-to-one -one stoichiometry? I mean, it's impossible. And you can't do real kinetics. So, a dirty little secret in the topoisomerase world is that there are zero real kinetic data. None of those are real kinetic data. They're all relative data, because you can't do it, because you can't even start. But look at the mini circles. They're exactly the same size. So we've shown by analytical ultracentrifugation that one topo binds to one uh, mini circle. Boom. We have defined our stoichiometry. We have defined our binding sites. There's never two to one. And now we can finally, for the first time, do real kinetics. And I'm going to digress from my question of what is the structural transition that happens with supercoiling, just for a second to show you a little bit of binding data. And just to show you what people, maybe you've never done these kinds of experiments, but this is what people are typically stuck with. So here is a plasmid run in a gel, in the gel electrophoresis we heard yesterday about. So here's no enzyme, and this enzyme is just a 
boring enzyme, a restriction enzyme, ECOR5. So if you add one to four ECOR5 to DNAs here, you get some smeary stuff. And if you add one to one, you have some smeary stuff. And if you add 10 to one, you finally see the supercoiled band start to shift a little bit. That's what people are stuck with quantifying. They say, oh, here it's looking as 10 to one binding, or maybe something like that. It's terrible, it's ugly, it's hideous. <coughs> finally, at 100 to one, it's all bound. And so maybe you'd say, oh, 100 to one is the answer. What's the answer? What's the question? It's very difficult. So here with the little tiny circle, here's the supercoiled circle. We don't have any of this other mess in our contamination, no contaminants in our preps. And if you add one molecule of ECOR4, ECOR5 to DNA, you see 25% binding. If you add one to one, you have 100% binding. If you add 10 to one, it's a big smeary, ugly mess. And if you have 100 to one, it just digs in the well. So we can very precisely determine stoichiometry and binding. And you can see that the resolution here is really nice compared to this. So that's just an example of why we wanted to go smaller. It's also faster to run. So here's real data with human topoisomerase 2 alpha, the um, target for about 40% of all anti-cancer drugs used worldwide. So this is a very important drug target. And we don't know so much about this enzyme. So here is free uh, mini circle. This one is nicked. And all we do is we start adding more and more topoisomerase until it shifts. And we can look at this binding curve and very precisely get a KD, a, a rate constant, for how well that thing will bind. And we do that over and over again for different degrees of supercoiling because I think I've mentioned to you we can start here, we can add one, 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 or go to the positive for the first time, one, one, one. And so we did that over the whole regime using these many vectors. And here's what we see. And note that there is a four log difference in the KD of human topo 2 alpha binding to DNA, depending only on the degree of underwinding or overwinding. So it seems that it binds the positive and the negative supercoiling relatively equally and much more tightly. It is now officially the tightest DNA binding protein ever measured. I think there are gonna be a lot more when they can be able to measure it precisely now with supercoiled DNA. And here is the KD for the relaxed DNA. So the one we know and love up here. Of course, the enzyme doesn't bind to that. It's not a substrate. What's it gonna do with relaxed DNA, right? Unless it's knotted and then it would unknot it, but if there's no knot in there, there's nothing to do. And the reason that this is an important thing to start with, before I show you the, the picture of the 3D structures of these things, is that we wanted to know, were they biologically active? Because one of the reviewers of a grant I wrote, I've never been funded for this work until very recently. And the reviewer said, you've made these tiny circles they can't be biologically relevant. So here is an enzyme that's very important, binding to it, and here's the same enzyme acting on it. And what's amazing, even to us, is, and this looks complicated, but it's so simple. Here is relaxed DNA. If you add topoisomerase, so here's minus topo plus topo, nothing happens because it has nothing to do with relaxed DNA. Here is minus one. If you have the minus one and you add topo two, it's gonna change in LK of two. It can't do anything with this, so it makes a mixture of minus and plus one. Minus two goes to zero, because it's an LK change of two. Minus three goes to a mix of minus and plus one. Minus four goes to zero, minus five, minus and plus one. Minus six goes to zero. Even the crazy hyper-negative supercoiling, 20% underwound, topoisomerase relaxes beautifully, has no problem. So this is not some kind of freaky thing. In fact, it's active. And let's look for the first time in the positive supercoil arena. So at plus one, you get the mix of plus and minus one. 
because plus one, you know, you can't go to zero from one. If you're doing okay, change it to two. So the plus two goes to zero. And interestingly, it has a hard time with the plus three. It doesn't act very well on it, but it does do some, and it only takes it to the plus one. It doesn't get the mix of the plus one and minus one, which tells us something really interesting about these enzymes that was never, ever known before. So everyone thought that it would be able, I mean, why doesn't it go to what it did this? Why doesn't it make a mix? There's something about the loading, the initial loading, that then sets how far it can go. So there's, this was an unexpected, but all we wanted for this talk was that every one of these things is active and every linking number when we purify them is absolutely pure. You don't see any cross-contamination. You don't see one in the two or two in the three. And that's important because we start to see some overlap in structure, but in fact that's true overlap and not contamination. So to get at this question of what does it look like in three dimensions, we used cryo-electron tomography. There have been major advances in the field that now allow us to do this. Maybe two years ago we could not have done this. So maybe you know how this works. So it's just like cryo-electron microscopy, except the tomography comes when you take the, the field and you tilt it in, in increments of two degrees, let's say. And you can go all the way 70 degrees one way and 70 degrees the other way. And now you can reconstruct, like in this picture, a three-dimensional image from multiple two-dimensional projections. And so this is really a good measure for potentially heterogeneous specimens, which ours ended up being. So this is just a movie showing us the raw data um, for this is the LK equal 2, so this has two overlinks. Topo loved it, relaxed it to zero, and that's 6% overwound. So let's have a look at what this looked like. So this is a slice of the ice, and we're looking at every single thing that we could see. And what we did is we put little dark spots on any density. We didn't care if it was a circle or not. Any density got spots, and this is what we ended up with at the end of the day. So this is what a typical field looks like um, of the raw data, and that's the only raw data I'm gonna show you. Uh, and this is the summary, and this is now published, so you are welcome to look at it, and the rest of the stuff that I'm showing you is not published. So here is a gel that you've, you're kind of used to looking at by now. So here's relaxed DNA, plus one, plus two, plus three. Here's minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, minus six. So this is how they run on gels. These are acrylamide gels, by the way, not agarose gels. So representative pictures of these three-dimensional objects are shown here. And very commonly, we saw these ellipses Okay, ellipse, never was it a perfect round circle. That was surprise number one. We thought these are 336 base pairs. That's two, that's a coon statistical length, or two persistence lengths. We thought that thing wanted to be open so much that it was just gonna be this ready to burst into a perfect circle, but it's elliptical. So that was a surprise, never was it a circle. So very commonly we saw these ellipses, and we also saw some kind of kinked ellipses. And we can look in RAS small, we can look in, in three dimensions. So we look very carefully in all dimensions for these calls. We see the figure eights, and we better have seen those. This is what everybody says we should see, right? Where the things seem to actually be touching in the middle. And then we saw things that look like rackets, where there's a handle here and a large loop, or a loop on two sides, or a loop on one side and then a long string, and then just a complete rod. And if you turn these 90 degrees, because as I said, we're looking in three dimensions here, this is what they look like. You can see this is very planar. This one has a little bit of, of writhe to it, and this one's planar, et cetera, et cetera. If we quantify this, and as far as we know, this was the first time anybody had quantified cryo-EM images 
using individual particles. So what you see people do is when they get these low resolution images is they average a whole lot of them. And if you average 8,000 of these, you're gonna get a perfect circle, right? Because it's, it's all gonna cancel out. So we did not average anything. What we did is we counted three people blind, they didn't know what LK they were looking at, said, what do I see? And they, you know, we looked at it in three dimension on this big, big screen, and everybody went blind. Um, and anyway, did I ever see it look like this? Well, in relaxed DNA, you mostly see look like that. But sometimes you see relaxed DNA with a little bit of a bend in it. But you never see relaxed DNA in a figure eight, or a racket, or handcuffs, or a needle, or a ride, ever. Well, what about Nick's DNA? That's sort of our control. Nick DNA and relaxed DNA might be different, right? So Nick DNA can have no torsional stress because there's a Nick there. The Nick DNA looked exactly like the relaxed DNA. Exactly. N here is how many individual particles were counted. So if we go in the negative direction, and that's this way, what you see is when you go from, from relaxed to minus one, you see this huge transition point where suddenly the DNA is majority a racket and a handcuff and then some other stuff. We'll get back to this other. You add another supercoil and you get every single possible conformation ever seen. What? So that's why I thought these things have contamination. And that's why that previous experiment is so important. That DNA is exactly the DNA that we froze. So there isn't a different, you know, some other hidden um, contaminant. So in the minus three, we finally start pushing this thing into the rised conformation. You might notice something different about the rise that we saw versus the rise that most people draw. Because of the, the charge of DNA, most people, when they draw writhe DNA, kind of draw it like that, right? With this kind of openness. It doesn't want to touch. It's highly positively charged. What we notice with these small circles right off is that the inside was absolutely smashed closed. So it would rather writhe than have that circle be bent. So that circle wants to be open. And that dominates, it seems, for these length scales. And finally, with increasing negative supercoiling, we finally get writhed DNA. And then more and more and more of this other that we'll get back to. What about the positive supercoiling? I told you nobody's ever looked at that before. So this is a whole new world. Well, the positive supercoiling had a pretty dramatic electrophoretic shift. We predicted that this would look just like the perfect little figure eight, because that's the only structural transition we could imagine that would cause a gel electrophoretic shift. In fact, it looks exactly like the relaxed DNA. And we did this over and over because we couldn't believe this. So what you see is that it's mostly the ellipse with a little bit of the bend, and then the complete writhed. What we hypothesize is that these things are writhing very, there's a transition very rapidly between complete writhed, but it can't stay there, and complete open. And we can't get the stuff in the middle, but we're trapping those two transitions. And that's telling us again about this incredible dynamic structure of DNA. And somehow that transition is what's captured by gel electrophoresis because this is pretty major. But people would say, because this is not a bleary band, it's not a doublet, it looks like a single band. What in the world, right? So that cross must be very rapid and enough to be causing a gel electrophoresis change. Finally, when you go to the plus two, just like when you went to the minus two, you open up every single possible conformation, except no of these other, none. Then at the next transition point to the plus three, we see some of the open and then a lot of this writhed. And the majority, other. What is other? Other are things that have never been predicted by elastic rod theory or by anybody or anything. They don't make sense. They're branched, they're three-legged, 
They're S-shaped. They have four lobes, L-shaped. And we repeatedly saw these really freaky shapes. What are they? Are they base flipped? Because if you have a base flip, you're now a pivot point at the other base. So you're infinitely flexible. We think at the end of each of these dramatic bends is a base flip or a kink. Um, or perhaps there's even Pauling-like DNA. And here is just a little movie of the negative supercoil compared to the positive supercoil in three dimensions. You can see the handedness very easily. And you see that this, the bend here must be incredibly tight, right? Incredibly tight. So that how do you facilitate such a dramatic bend? I think it has to be a base flip. All right, so we always did molecular dynamic simulations. We either did explicit or implicit solvated simulations um, to accompany all of these. I'm not going to show you those. So if it's base flipping, then that means bases are exposed. And BAL31 is an enzyme that probes for exposed bases. And what you can see is as you increase, this is the same kind of gel we've looked at before. Relaxed DNA doesn't rea react with BAL31 because there's no exposed bases, so nothing. If it's underwound by one, it, relax, it gets clipped immediately. If it's minus two, so on. Very, very rapidly is it clipped by BAL31. And then the positive direction, not until you start getting these other, do you now have the bases exposed. So if you look at the threshold of well, BAL31 will cleave, there's a very strong threshold of around, guess what, biologically relevant supercoiling. Bases are exposed at the point where DNA starts to become active. It's pretty cool. In the positive direction, it takes a lot more positive supercoiling to finally expose bases, but again, you can do it. But if you put these on the same scale, this shows you the kinetics of base exposure of these circles. All right? And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we did this with chemical probing as well. So this chemical will bind to exposed bases exactly the same effects. So we mapped where the cleavage sites were, and that's really cool. But if you know Craig Benham's predictions, he, he has this beautiful algorithm. We plugged in our sequences into it. Here it is online. He said that we should have a BAL31 cleavage site right here. Here it is, with very, very high confidence. But we mapped our BAL31 site right here. And our molecular dynamic simulation said right here is where the base flip was. So this makes argument for this cooperative kinking model of Stasiak. Um, and again, in the, talks about how DNA supercoiling can communicate across circles, which is pretty neat. I'm not going to go into that because Marielle is telling me that I'm out of time. But you physicists are always asking me for effective salts on these things. So we haven't done this for all the structures, but we have looked at the effective salts on gel electrophoresis. And what you can see is if you don't have salt, in the negative supercoiling, it just flattens out and doesn't run. So there's not a lot of writhe. But if you add the salt, boom, you can flatten out. So this is a very sensitive way to compare across salts. So we did this over and over and over and over. And here's some, the bottom line for all of these data. Is in the positive supercoiling domain, it doesn't matter if you have salt or magnesium or calcium or what. It is impervious. The structure seems to be impervious, at least if, as measured by gel electrophoresis mobility. But negative supercoiling is highly dependent on the salt concentration. And here it is from magnesium. Physiologically, magnesium is around 5 millimolar. But at the point of mitosis, it suddenly jumps to 50 millimolar. So we're thinking that magnesium influx and calcium influx could have dramatic effects on shapes of supercoil. So this is how we explain all of these data. 
that the relaxed DNA can become positively supercoiled and more positively supercoiled. But in the negative domain, it can become negative or it can start to denature in low salt. But with higher salt, you can force that to be more writhe. And that can somewhat act elastic rod-like. And in summary, each mini circle that we looked at, each topoisomer, has a very reproducible, unique fingerprint of its distribution of conformations. And each topoisomer is exquisitely sensitive to monovalent and divalent cations and drugs. I didn't show you that today. The positive and negative are dramatically different. Um, DNA behaves like an isotropic elastic rod for the very little bit of positive supercoiling. And other than that, it does not ever look like that. So I, I showed you the BAL31 cleaves. That's indica indicative of bases exposed, and glyoxyl binds all the negative supercoiled type isomers and the most extreme positive. And the negative supercoiled DNA demonstrates this cooperative kinking. So in the future, we're going to start adding enzymes to this, drugs, and see which things are bound by what. And these are the wonderful people I get the privilege of working with. Today, I talked mostly about work from Jonathan Falk, a new assistant professor in my lab. Jamie Catney is a former uh, postdoc, has now taken a job as a professor at Rice University across the street. Steve Ludke is um, the creator of Eman, and he's really wonderful with his student, Mu Yang. Sarah Harris could continue to do the molecular dynamic simulations of the circles, and Wa Chu and his long-term associate, Mike Schmidt, and her, their graduate student, at Rossi, did all this work. And this is our funding we're very grateful for, and here is my awesome lab. And I hope I can take some questions. <laughs>